uh, primitive savagery. And why don't I like this? The main reason, I think, is that they're attacking the use of reason itself. Anyone who reads the attacks on me will think two things. One, what a rotter he is, and in that they might not be so far wrong. But they would also perhaps feel that the scientific attacks on me are staggering by their intellectual dishonesty. And this is a curious feature because they don't want the use of reason to prevail. If people can think for themselves, they'll start wanting to vote for themselves. So if you can stop them thinking for themselves, then the battle for dictatorship is essentially won. Now, the, the use of reason is one of the three great powers of the soul in Christian thought, along with the memory and the will. And the use of reason is the central power in Christian theology. And it is in our soul, which is composed of these three powers, the memory, the understanding, and the will, that our distance from the rest of the visible creation is most clearly visible. That's what makes us human, if you like. But that's also what makes us design, because in that, our closeness to our Creator is made most visible. And that is what Agenda 21 and all the related movements such as global warming want to take away. They want us to stop thinking and stop reasoning. And I'm against that. One of my there's not also a profit motive on the part of a number of these people that are from this. Yes. Could you illustrate some that you might think are ready with the Fist. Certainly. How can you too make money out of global warming? <laughs> well, the first thing is you can set up yourself as a vice president of the United States and then retire. And then you can make a bad sci-fi comedy horror movie and hawk it round the schools until the High Court comes along in London and says, hang on a moment, there are rather a number of serious errors in this movie and uh, we're going to ban the film unless 77 pages of corrective guidance are sent round and then you, you don't make so much money after that. Or you can be a duke or even a viscount provided you have land on which somebody can build windmills you can take a share of the revenue from the windmills they put on your land. These will be subsidised by taxpayers generally. So just as should always be the case the poor should subsidise the aristocracy <laughs> via their taxes. <laughs> I'm only joking, by the way. But, I just uh, but then, uh, what is another way to make money? Of course, you can be a windmill manufacturer, make a fortune out of that, or a solar panel manufacturer, or, like uh, Professor Tim Flannery uh, of, the, of Australia, who is now their chief climate commissioner, he had a wonderful boondoggle a few years ago to try and uh, dig down through the earth pump water in through one hole, back up through the other, and the earth being hotter down below than up here, it would come up as steam and you could drive a turbine and get lots of electricity. It's called geothermal power. Well, they tried this with one and a half million dollars, I think it was, of taxpayers' money, and the thing blew up and blew the entire taxpayer investment. And Flannery's reward for this noble effort of throwing away one and a half million dollars of taxpayers' money was to become the chief climate commissioner of Australia. Doesn't matter how wrong you get this, as long as you make the right noises. Or you can be a bureaucrat or a politician. And they depend for their income and their salaries and their pensions and their mansions and all the other luxuries and um, private jets that go with politics these days on the generosity of the taxpayer. So if you can invent a boondoggle like global warming, which allows you vastly to increase your regulatory powers and your taxation at scales, then you do what the civil service in Britain calls increasing the tax base. And every time they say that, they slaver as they see their empires expanding and the revenues increasing. So the bureaucratic class makes money. And the media make money out of it also, because, hey, if I run a story saying climate continuing changeable, that would be true but unexciting, and I wouldn't sell many papers that way. But supposing I said, planet doomed sensation, pictures, pages 4 to 37, I'm going to sell shed loads of papers and make lots of money. 
So which side is the press going to be on in this story? Always the side of the alarmists, and they're going to make a lot of money out of it until the truth begins to dawn. And the very fact that Agenda 21 has now been set up and started running shows that they've all realised that the global, global warming boondoggle, bandwagon and gravy train are all about to tip into the gulch and they need to find some other way of trying to extract vast amounts of additional taxpayers' money from us. Well, they failed with global, global warming, they will fail with Agenda 21. I'd like to briefly say, no, just a question. Just a question, please. Okay. Um, how will we know if and when we have global warming? We have global warming since the United States, but the nation did not. Very good question. How will we know if we're contributing in a significant fashion? How much of a planet do we have to burn for the heat up? And how fast do we have to do it? Right. Very good. How much global warming will we get and how will we tell whether that's us or something else? The fact is that until thousands of years have passed, we won't know if you believe the official analysis of the IPCC because they say that the global warming we trigger now will not be complete for 3,000 years. So not all of it will happen within our lifetimes anyway. But then it's very difficult to distinguish, in fact it's impossible uh, in, the, in the state of science now, to distinguish between warming caused by a natural recovery from the Little Ice Age. That recovery began in 1695. Madam, even you are too young to remember that. And so, uh, 1695, and it's been going on uh, at various rates ever since. How can we tell whether that natural recovery of temperatures has stopped and uh, we're now getting something additional caused by us? Well, one possible metric might be to say, was there a medieval warm period? And was it warmer than today? Well, something like 1,200 scientists from more than 600 institutions in 44 countries have contributed to papers over the last 25 years providing evidence from the paleoclimate record, from everything from sediments to stalagmites to ice cores to uh, boreholes and various other ways that the medieval warm period was real, was global, and was warmer than the present. If they are right, then today's temperatures are not exceptional, in which case it's very hard to say that at the moment we can discern any human influence on global climate at all. And that was the original conclusion of the 1995 IPCC report, as submitted by the scientists. For the second time they said we can't actually distinguish a human signature at all. Now the bureaucrats took one look and said we, we can't have this. This is unacceptable. They'll close us down if we're saying for the second time that we're not having any influence on the climate. So they got one scientist to rewrite it. And all five references to the statement that we couldn't discern a human influence on global climate were taken out. <laughs> 200 consequential amendments were also made. And a single new statement was inserted, which says uh, it is now clear that there is a discernible human influence on global climate. The precise opposite of what the scientists who had written and submitted the final document had said. So the answer is that science is with us in saying you can't tell the difference between anthropogenic and uh, natural warming and one of the reasons why you can't is the anthropogenic warming is small enough that certainly over the last 10 or 15 years there hasn't been any global warming in total at all because presumably there is some natural factor such as a decline in the activity of the sun which is now countervailing against the comparatively gentle upward pressure on temperatures which our addition of CO2 will cause. Bottom line, there is no problem with the climate. Even if there were, it would be cheaper and more cost effective by hundreds of times over to do nothing about it than to pursue the present mad policies to try to forestall it. And therefore the best policy to address the non-problem of the climate is to have the courage to do nothing. Man. I find it entertaining that we've had such monumental changes in climate, like the carboniferous, before there have ever been on the earth. All this happened to black people. Now, madam, she's, she's harking back there uh, to the carboniferous, which she remembers well, <laughs> and, and, and reminding us that temperatures then were quite a bit higher than they are now. And in fact, for most of the last 
750 million years, and she will join me in agreeing with this, um, there has been uh, temperature most of the time has been around 8 Celsius warmer than it is today. At no time has it been much below uh, 8 Celsius colder than it is today. And we are around about in the middle. So you, we haven't seen much of a variation in temperature up or down from that central line over the last 750 million years, despite the enormous influences of changes in the sun, intergalactic dust, impacts of, of meteors and comets, huge supervolcano eruptions, and changes in the, in the eccentricity, obliquity, and uh, nutation of the Earth. All of these things have, have exercised over the millennia major influences which have only resulted in extraordinarily small changes in temperature, in absolute terms less than 3% up or down from what we infer was the mean temperature over the last uh, 750 million years, which is roughly the temperature which we enjoy today. So the idea that by altering the composition of the atmosphere by one part in 2000, converting it from oxygen to carbon dioxide over the next 100 years, we are suddenly going to fling the Earth into some new and strange state that it's never seen before is plainly barking nonsense. Thank you for your question. Sir? Uh, could you comment on the uh, issue of Islamization in Europe and the demographic uh, implications that there may be? Uh... Certainly. In Russia, this year, the number of Muslims, for the first time, outnumbered all others in the population. The Muslims. And this is also about to happen in France, probably in 10 or 15 years. It will happen in Britain within 30 years. And we can't tell exactly because the rate of immigration from Islamic countries is so very high, and the birth rate uh, from the Islamists, of course, is much higher than, than ours for two reasons. One, because they are now breeding deliberately using what is called the power of the womb to outnumber us. And two, because we practice the extraordinarily vile habit of murdering our children in the womb, not even giving them an anaesthetic before we tear them limb from limb piecemeal. And if by some mischance they are born alive, they are left to gasp their fluttering last on some cold hospital draining board under the cold glare of the strip lights and the still colder glare of their butchers. We are killing the West in the most direct way possible by killing very large numbers of our children. And this shameful practice is one which is not followed in Islam. They don't do it. They don't believe in it. And in that one overriding respect, and I'll explain why I say overriding in a moment, in that one overriding respect, they are morally superior to us in the West. In many other respects, they are inferior morally. But in that respect, they are morally superior and they know it. And it is that knowledge of an overriding moral superior, superiority that we, don't kill, that we kill our children in the womb and they don't that leads them to exploit this moral difference to the point of increasing their numbers in our countries by as much immigration as they can get away with and as much breeding as they can get away with and as many of you may yet not be too old to remember breeding is fun so they are taking possession of the world as we are throwing away the West. We're throwing away our future because we are throwing away our children and putting the bit into the hospital incinerator. And until we learn to stop doing that, two consequences will follow. One, there's no point in our worrying about the progressive Islamization of our societies because it will happen with ever-increasing rapidity, and two, we had better not think that we're morally superior, because we're not. <laughs>